as we've already seen, the reason that this struggles to react with um, bromine or chlorine uh, in the absence of a catalyst is to do with the low pi electron density, which means that the attraction to an electrophile is weak compared to um, an alkene. So what a catalyst would have to do to make an electrophilic reaction possible is to somehow make that attraction um, greater. And the way the halogen carrier catalyst does that is by making the electrophile much more attractive than it otherwise would be. Because remember, to react with bromine on its own, you depend on this polarization of the bromine resulting from repulsion from the pi electrons. And because the pi electrons are, are, are kind of spread out around the ring, they have low electron density, that polarization is weak. And consequently, the attractive force between this delta positive bromine and those electrons in the ring is not strong enough to drag them out of the ring. What we need is to make something much more attractive so that it's better able to pull an electron pair out of the ring. And that's what the halogen carrier does. So let's start, we'll leave the benzene for the moment because what the catalyst does is actually initially to react with the bromine. So you get this reaction. AlBr3 can react with bromine to give you AlBr4 minus plus Br plus. That's a very surprising looking reaction. You're not used to seeing um, elements like chlorine and bromine, which are you know, very good at attracting electrons into their outer shell, actually losing an electron and forming a positive ion. Now, in reality, that equation is a bit of an oversimplification. These are not really completely separate ions. Um, so this bromine is only slightly delta positive, but nevertheless, um, it's a lot more delta positive than you would have uh, just from polarization from the ring. So we're going to stick with this. This simplified version of the equation is perfectly good enough for um, understanding what's happening at A level. And it makes the point very clearly that what you've generated is something which is going to be a very potent electrophile because it has a big positive charge on it not just that slight delta positive that you got from polarization. And that's always the key with electrophilic substitution reactions, that they usually depend on having a catalyst, and the strategy is always the same, that that catalyst turns something that could potentially be an electrophile, but just isn't all that attractive, into something that's really, really attractive. So once we've got that, we're good to go, because now Here's our benzene, here's our Br+, plus, and that's going to be able to attract an electron pair out of the ring. And remember, we show movement of a pair of electrons using a curly arrow. So, curly arrow coming out from the pi system, and you must do it specifically from the circle in the middle to show that it's a pair of electrons coming out of the delocalized pi system and being grabbed by that Br+. Plus. So what does that give you? Well, it gives you something that looks like this. So one of the carbons of the ring is now going to have an extra bond because one of these six carbons is now going to make use of this electron pair to make a new bond to the bromine. It will still have its hydrogen attached as well. So if we make it the one at the top, it will still have its original hydrogen attached, but it will have a bromine as well. Now what that means is that this carbon can no longer have any pi bonding because it's got four sigma bonds, as you can see, so it can't be part of any pi system. But the remaining carbons are still um, involved in the delocalized system. It's just that that now has been cut up so that instead of spanning all six carbons, it only spans five. So you can draw it like that. So it looks like a smiley face, but you have to draw it carefully to make sure that it spans these five carbons only and not the one at the top. Now, you can tell that can't be quite the whole story because we had a positive charge over here. And remember, charge is always conserved. You can't just have a charge disappearing. 
so where's the positive charge now? Well, if you think about it, this delocalized system now contains four pi electrons because there were six here. Okay, so there are six delocalized pi electrons in the original state, one from each carbon. But out of those six, two of them have now been used to make this bond. So there are only four left. So there are four delocalized pi electrons but they're spread around five carbons one two three four five and that's therefore where the positive charge is because you can see that between them those five carbons are down by one electron so we put the positive charge there to show that it's spread out around what's left of the delocalized system there. So we've got a kind of carbocation intermediate, but it's different from carbocations we've seen in the past because there, there was a specific carbon that had the positive charge. Here, the positive charge is spread out around those five. Now, it's not gonna be happy to stay in that state because this, delo this completely delocalized aromatic system is extremely favorable. We've seen the evidence for that from the um, enthalpy data and so on. Um, and so this is going to be desperate to get back to that state. And so what has to happen next is something which will regenerate the pi system in the middle. And the way it manages to do that is to break the bond to hydrogen. It breaks it heterolytically so that both of the electrons from that bond go back into the ring and the hydrogen is left behind as H+. Plus. So you get this. We've regenerated the intact aromatic delocalized system. So we're back to that in the middle. We've still got the bromine attached, but the hydrogen has left. And because both of the electrons went into here, that hydrogen doesn't have any. So it's left as H+. Plus. So we've made our first product but we haven't quite completed the reaction because remember the ALBr3 is a catalyst. So it's got to be still there unused at the end and at the moment it isn't because it's been converted into ALBr4 minus. So the final step has got to regenerate the catalyst. And what it's also got to do is to create our other product, which remember when we wrote the overall equation was HBr. So if we remind you of the overall equation for the reaction was this, that plus Br2 has given you substitution product, which we've made successfully, but we know that HBr is the other product. So we've got to get that because we haven't got that at the moment. And you can see both of those things we need to do are achieved by a very simple reaction, which is this, that the AlBr4 minus that was created here alongside our Br plus electrophile, that's still floating around at the moment. It can react with this H plus that was created here. Okay, so these two things, this one created in the first step, this one created later on, can react with each other to give you AlBr3 plus HBr. And that's our second product, HBr and the ALBr3 is our catalyst regenerated. So you need to learn that mechanism. It's called electrophilic substitution because obviously it's a substitution. The bromine replaces the hydrogen and the Br plus is the electrophile because remember an electrophile is an electron pair acceptor and that's what it's doing, accepting this incoming electron pair there. Um, so practice that. Make sure you're careful drawing the intermediate. Um, make sure you can count the pi electrons. They quite often ask you about how many pi electrons are there here, how many pi electrons are there there. So make sure you can see why it's going from six to four, because two of them have now been used to form that new bond. And make sure you know the whole story with the catalyst about how it reacts first with the bromine to generate this reactive intermediate, and then the catalyst is regenerated at the end. You need to know some other mechanisms for um, 
benzene reactions but the good news is that they all follow basically the same pattern as this one so if you make sure you've really understood this one first when we go on to the remaining ones you should find it very easy the second really important electrophilic substitution that you need to learn is nitration so once again if we start with benzene nitration is a reaction with nitric acid so HNO3 and what it does is a substitution reaction and what it substitutes in in place of a hydrogen is an NO2 group which is called a nitro group um, and the other product of that reaction if you balance it up is water so that's the overall reaction and it produces this compound which is called nitrobenzene um, so again you've got to learn that you can do that now the specific conditions that you need to learn are relatively sort of extreme in this case you can't just use any old nitric acid you have to use concentrated nitric acid and you also have to use a catalyst which is concentrated sulfuric acid okay so the nitrating mixture which you add to your aromatic compound is a mixture of these two concentrated acids together and that then makes the the nitration happen relatively easily so learn the conditions learn the equation make sure you know that NO2 is what a nitro group is and once again we can look at the mechanism and what you'll hopefully see is that it's easy to understand the mechanism because it's very closely related to the halogenation one that you've already learned um, so nitric acid has a structure that looks like this um, so you can see that this nitrogen is going to be delta positive because it's got all these oxygens around it so it could act as a um, an electrophile on its own it could accept an incoming pair of electrons in its own right but the problem as we saw with the halogenation reaction is that the electron density there is low in that ring and therefore the attraction between the delocalized system there and the electrophile is likely to be too weak to pull an electron pair out of the ring and that's the problem with nitric acid so the same as with halogenation we've got to turn it from that which it's not that it couldn't be an electrophile it's just not a very good one and we've got to turn it into a much more powerful one with a big positive charge and that once again is where the catalyst comes in so the reaction between nitric acid and sulfuric acid goes like this okay so making that mixture of concentrated acids gives you these products and the one that's important is that one because again you can see that you now have something that has a full positive charge and the positive charge is on the nitrogen um, so once again we've generated a powerful electrophile by putting the catalyst in because it has a full positive charge you can also see it's probably worth mentioning from this equation why you need concentrated acids because this is an equilibrium and if the concentration of water is very high it will drive the equilibrium back that way and you'll get very little NO2 plus formed so by using concentrated acids which don't contain very much water then it allows the equilibrium to lie far enough over this way to give you um, a reasonable concentration of NO2 plus so again it's Le Chatelier in action there um, okay so NO2 plus is our electrophile what I think would be good for you to do is to see if you can figure out the mechanism yourself just by analogy with the halogenation we'll write it up in a minute but if you haven't already read it through 
pause the video at this point ha have another look at the halogenation one if you haven't taken that on board yet and see if you can adapt it to figure out what happens next and how you end up getting this product okay so we got benzene and we've got NO2 plus and once again it's the positive charge the big positive charge here that's attracting an electron pair out of the ring so it's coming from there and it's got to point specifically to the nitrogen not just vaguely to the NO2 plus because it's the nitrogen that ends up um, being connected to the um, being connected to the to the ring so it's got to be the nitrogen that's on the receiving end there and that will give you an intermediate that looks very similar to the one that we saw in halogenation so we now have one of the carbons having still its hydrogen attached but it now has NO2 attached as well and so that carbon has had to drop out of the delocalized system and that now just extends around the remaining five carbons like that and the positive charge that was on the NO2 plus is now shared out amongst those carbons so we write it there okay so that's our intermediate and again just as in halogenation it's not going to want to stay there for very long because it wants to get back to being aromatic it wants that complete delocalized system and it gets that by pulling in this electron pair the shared pair that's making that bond so you draw a curly arrow from the middle of the bond coming back into the ring like that make sure it comes to the middle of the bond not from the hydrogen it's not the hydrogen atom that's going into the ring it's that shared pair that's coming back into there and that will restore your aromatic ring and give you your nitrobenzene the NO2 group there and again just as in the halogenation you get H plus so we've made our first product uh, we've also made our water that's there but what we have got to do is to get a catalyst back so at the moment it's in the form of HSO4- minus. if it's a catalyst it means it doesn't use get used up so it's got to be converted back into there and you can see that's easily going to happen because we've got an H plus here that we've just generated so our final step takes the H plus from this step and the HSO4 from that step and they simply join together to restore your sulfuric acid so that's why the sulfuric acid is a catalyst because although it's involved in the reaction it gets regenerated at the end so it doesn't get used up overall so once again that's a mechanism you have to learn in detail but um, understanding it is easy once you've learnt the halogenation one it's just learning the detail of the conditions really